The project involves looking at some key concepts in Deleuze, as I explained in another video. Incidentally, I've just remembered that Deleuze follows this approach himself with Spinoza's work, Deleuze 1988, picking out key terms like attribute or mode. Deleuze puts them in alphabetical order, but I think that can be a bit arbitrary. The rhizome is perhaps the most famous concept, well liked by people trying to apply Deleuze or Deleuze and Guattari. Any gardener can think of an example of a rhizome. Plants like the iris, ginger, certain kinds of bamboo or cooch grass have underground roots or stems. When you pull up a shoot of cooch grass sticking up through the soil, you uncover a straggly, white, tough, fibrous stem that wanders off unpredictably under the surface. Sometimes you find it connected unexpectedly to another green shoot somewhere else. Lots of apparently unconnected bits of cooch grass are totally connected underground. Deleuze and Guattari get a bit defensive about the term rhizome in a thousand plateaus and say they now realise there's a need to convince people with a list of properties. Rather than just reproducing this list though, which is not very helpful at first, I suggest as usual we try something different. Of course you don't have to follow my thinking or agree with me, try the techniques for yourself. One other difficulty is that the term is used as an introduction to the major philosophical arguments being developed in a thousand plateaus, and the definitions themselves can get a bit lost in the process. I suggest we focus on those definitions and what is implied by them at first, but we also note the wider implications. Of course, again, this is only one suggestion for an approach, there are lots of others. I don't want people who are just beginning to get too distracted or overwhelmed by the enormity of the work, uh, all the things that are involved to track down all the implications. First, I've been pretty selective, inevitably. Secondly, I've divided up the commentary and you'll hear two voices to indicate the split in focus. The second one belongs to Maggie Harris. My sections discuss some implications that arise. They need not worry complete beginners right away, but others might want to think about them as they go along. There is a transcript available. As before, I suggest we think about this while watching some slow video. I've been recently trying out my amateur steady cam gear and going for a single take on a recent walk. I apologise if anyone gets seasick with the wobbles or the whippy pans. Ironically, the video features lots of shots of trees. First, we need to locate where the topic of the rhizome is discussed, and luckily it's fairly easy in this case. We'll start with the book by Deleuze and Guattari, A Thousand Plateaus, where nearly all, or perhaps even all, the references to the rhizome can be found. That book has an index too. If you look up the term rhizome, you will find quite a number of definitions. Let's start with the specific ones. It's clear that it's not just plants that are rhizomes, because the terms also used to describe ant colonies, Rat burrows, the city of Amsterdam, the Freudian unconscious, liberated sexual activity, musical forms, aspects of American culture, both the cultural underground and the Wild West, forms of guerrilla warfare, and even the path of a pool of oil as it runs downstream. We're told, for that matter, that the book itself is a rhizome. Occasionally, other things are called rhizomes as well as you work through the book. So again, what I'm suggesting is that we locate these actual definitions and also read a bit around them in the text to 
get some idea of what they might mean. One thing to note right away is that not all these examples relate to human beings. In discussions like this, Deleuze and Guattari want to talk about things found in nature as well. It would be limiting to confine what they say to human affairs, although sometimes this is what happens. Concepts like the rhizome are discussed in terms of human activities alone. Thinking, writing, wandering. This is an anthropomorphic reading of Deleuzean work, and it is only one option. More on this in a minute. But for now, the suggestion is that the more general accounts of the rhizome stress that human activity is connected to lots of other areas. Pure rhizome is infinitely connectable, with each point having the capacity to connect with any other point in any other system. We'll also find some more challenging general, theoretical or philosophical descriptions and comments. The first example isn't too bad and I'm going to use it a bit later on. We are told that, for example, a rhizome is a map and not a tracing. That it's open and connectable in all of its dimensions. That's page 13 in my edition of A Thousand Plateaus. Incidentally, in the same section, there's a reference to something called decalcomania. Now, this is sometimes taken to be a really crucial component of rhizomes in some commentaries, but, but I think it's just another example. The term seems to refer to a technique to add decoration to pottery as a sort of applique. Well, I don't know enough about it to see what exactly is rhizomatic about this technique. Perhaps it has to respond to small changes in the surface texture of the pot, as well as the artistic intentions of the potter. We find a few more abstract remarks as well. We are told that the rhizome has no beginning and end. It is a matter of alliance rather than filiation. It proceeds by the conjunction and dot 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 and dot 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 and. Apparently some American literature and English literature shows exactly this rhizomatic direction following the logic of the and. I think what this means is that these works don't follow conventional narratives but simply move from one episode to the next. We have no examples specified here by Deleuze and Guattari Maybe you can think of some. I thought of James Joyce and Ulysses, but of course he's neither American nor English. Perhaps I'm being too literal. We're also told that the multiple must always be made, not by adding a higher dimension, but with the number of dimensions one already has available. Always n minus 1 and in brackets the only way the one belongs to the multiple, colon, always subtracted. We have to subtract the unique from the multiplicity to be constructed, right at n minus one dimensions. A system of this kind, we're told, would be called a rhizome. Later on, the rhizome is composed of dimensions or directions in motion. Now you might note here, I think, that uh, Deleuze and Guattari are using a mathematical notion of a dimension, which uh, means a direction, a line joining points. The rhizome has no beginning or end, only a middle. French word here is milieu, which of course also means context, from which it grows and overspills. The rhizome constructs linear multiplicities with n dimensions. It has no subject or object. It moves on a plane of consistency from which the 1, capital O, is always subtracted, n minus 1. So things are starting to get a bit more complicated, and in fact they start to get complicated quite quickly. Even the simple examples we began with so we're told that uh, plants have rhizomatic roots, but they also connect these rhizomes with other things, other dimensions, if you like, 
like the wind or animals or human beings and the whole thing is now being described as a rhizome. As for human life, we're told that a rhizome ceaselessly establishes connections between semiotic chains, that is, uh, systems of meaning, organisations of power, and circumstances relative to the arts, sciences, and social struggles. Well, this is starting to look a bit scary. We are urged always to trace connections like this, always to follow rhizomes until we get to the most abstract and tortuous connections. These are lines of flight away from specific examples and they will eventually lead us to a completely abstract or pure mechanism or machine operating on the mysterious plane of consistency. It's that purified rhizome as a machine with no specific empirical bits at all that is being referred to in the obscure stuff I read out just now with all the terms like multiplicities and n dimensions. It's very tempting indeed to ignore these complications and go with what you know already, the rhizome as an underground route. Some people have got some mileage from this simple metaphor and found some immediate applications to human and social life. The way in which some people learn, for example, as they trail from one task to another, wandering along directed by their interests and personal motives and sometimes by unconscious drives. This is only a metaphorical connection though and Deleuze actually doesn't like metaphors because he sees them as the result of lazy thinking, not going into the issues, the actual similarities and differences between plants and animals, which we discuss in a minute. Metaphors are not for philosophers. So my suggestion is that we try something a bit like Deleuze's method, slightly more ambitious, and we try to work in all the examples and then try to see, as a first stage, how the more general and obscure definitions fit in. So we're going to use our own common forms of thinking again, although as you've already gathered from the discussion about the metaphor, Deleuze has serious objections to the ways in which ordinary thought processes work. We'll mention a couple more as we go along. It seems that Deleuze and Guattari see something in common between human activities and the activities of animals like ants and rats or even trickles of oil. We could think in terms used in classical philosophy and ask if there is some underlying essential quality here. One suggestion would be that we are all created by God. We are all his creatures. Theologians have amused themselves for centuries with this sort of inquiry and its implications. Does God create everything? And if he doesn't, who does? Does he create each individual ant or just the species? Is he there in each patch of oil? A currently fashionable view would take another option and say the links occur because there is some cosmic consciousness that connects us all to the natural world, that even plants have some kind of consciousness of their surroundings. But do trickles of oil? The actual emphasis is possibly the other way around though. Plant rhizomes develop not at random, but by responding to local differences in their environment concerning moisture, temperature, nutrient contents and so on. Rats and ants might respond to chemical or physical differences in their environments, the texture of the surface, gradient and so on. Trickles of oil also respond to local gradients, obstacles at the micro scale and the general effects of gravity. This is not really consciousness, but more a basic detection of different sorts of intensity, of chemicals of gra or gravitational forces. Humans have the capacity to turn these intensive qualities into extensive forms and subsequently measure them. 
that plants and the rest of the universe operate effectively at the intensive level, noting differences, gradients, threshold and the like instead of making precise measurements. It is often the case that these differences drive human actions too. We are not conscious of all of them. We are affected by physical aspects of our environment. Our environment produces affects. Now the term affect has been colonised by recent psychology to mean just emotions, but Deleuze sees an effect in an earlier 17th century way to mean anything that affects us, usually registered at the bodily level. That produces things in our minds like emotions and feelings. We respond to chemicals in our bodies and in our environment. We respond to external forces like gravity by feeling happy if we lose weight, sad if we put it on and feel gravity tugging us down. We are nervous thinking of the effects of falling from height, dragged away by gravity, elated at the feeling of g-forces on an accelerating motorcycle, and so on. The best place to find this view of effects and how they work on bodies is Deleuze's book on Spinoza, Deleuze 1988, or the online lectures on Spinoza, Deleuze 2007. This could also be what they mean by the section on page 9 of A Thousand Plateaus. Puppet strings, as a rhizome or multiplicity, are tied not to the supposed will of an artist or puppeteer, but to a multiplicity of nerve fibres which form another puppet, let's call them the weave. It might be objected that its multiplicity resides in the person of the actor who projects it into the text. Granted, but the actor's nerve fibres in turn form a weave. So human rhizomes are like plant rhizomes, not because we share some essential consciousness, but because we are all affected by intensities of forces in our environments. OK, well, we've tried a philosophical approach. Let's try another normal technique of thinking found in the social sciences this time. We can start by asking, do the examples we've seen share common observable properties? Well, vigorous cooch grass roots, ants on the march, rats building burrows, tourists wandering around Amsterdam and gorillas operating in enemy territory do not follow the suggested routes, nor do they follow logical choices binary choices when they decide which way to proceed. The claim is here that you can't fit them into a logical pattern like an algorithm, to use the modern term, or a decision tree or command tree, to use older terms. And this, incidentally, is the tree that Deleuze and Guattari are referring to when they contrast rhizomes and trees at several places in the book. Let's start a theoretical adventure by considering a fairly harmless comment made earlier. A rhizome is a map and not a tracing, open and connectable in all its dimensions. To go back to our example, guerrilla fighters and tourists use maps on paper or in their heads, but as we said, they don't always stick to the prescribed routes or tracings and, with a bit of poetic license, you could see ants on the march and perhaps even the other examples as showing the same qualities, responding to local and immediate bits of environment wherever they lead, as we saw. So the rhizome as a map offers more possible routes than the usual specific ones that might be traced out for us, ones that we follow from inertia or habit, or because we've been told to do so by various authorities. So we're developing a more general or theoretical notion here. We could even use the term abstract structure for a rhizome 
although we should note that Deleuze does not like either of those specific terms. The simplest reason for that, incidentally, is that terms like abstract or theoretical tend to imply that the structure that results is not real, that it exists only in our heads, that the qualities are derived only from thought or imagination. We certainly have to ignore or explain away several aspects that might not fit this sort of theoretical model. By contrast, Deleuze makes the extraordinary claim that these structures are real, that they exist in reality, although it is another dimension of reality that they exist in. He calls this the virtual dimension, and here we find abstract or purified objects with no empirical components. This is obviously not to be confused with the current uses of the term virtual dimension to refer to realistic computer-generated images. Deleuze doesn't like the more usual philosophical argument that this is a transcendental level of reality. He is criticising Kant, Hegel or Husserl here, but you might know of a popular transcendental approach in modern critical realism associated with Roy Basker, for example, Basker 1980, and others. If you don't know this stuff, don't worry, of course. Another extraordinary claim is that operations at the virtual level explain all the empirical examples and their characteristics. Well, we'll come to this argument when we consider the hexiety in another presentation, but for now the argument is that all the specific examples we've mentioned are tracings that can be put back on underlying maps. Now, this is not the normal notion of a map. Rhizomes at this level of reality, the virtual, are maps which are open and connectable in all dimensions, always capable of extending themselves into ever larger maps, operating not in two dimensions like normal maps, but more, however many dimensions there are, n. Nor are virtual rhizomes limited to just joining up with things that they have already connected together or established. They are very flexible and they can join themselves onto almost anything, any activity, any environment or context. They have no definite endpoint. They just cheerfully add on these additional dimensions in the series connected by the term and following alliance rather than filiation in Deleuze and Guattari's terms. In other words, they don't have to be the same kind of thing, not in the same family as the things that they have already connected. Organic can connect with inorganic, animal with human, living things with non-living, and so on. To take one obvious example, power systems ally themselves to linguistic systems so that we are constrained both by direct force and a set of psychological mechanisms that make us feel guilty if we disobey. And there's a linguistic system that seems to offer us unconstrained creative free speech but of course also imposes limits. So where is all this leading, I hear you ask? in a philosophical direction, aiming to answer philosophical questions. These people are philosophers. They're interested in questions like, what is reality? Now, you might not want to follow the story this far just yet, but you should note that that's where Deleuze and Guattari are heading, in my view anyway. They use specific examples, not as models, so that we can go out and understand the world, but to get to more general philosophy. There are practical implications, but they follow only after we followed their trail into the virtual and left specific constraints and limitations well behind us. And when we return to the practical, we must expect to meet reintroduced mixtures, impure combinations, 
say of both rhizomes and tree structures. It is a strange story and one that goes very far away from common sense. We have seen that rhizomes offer quite different specific characteristics in practice, but that they might have some general properties that are not so visible. They feature ceaseless connections and constant growth into other areas. But this is not determined or controlled by human beings or gods, or some ultimate purpose. They have no subject or object. They seem to proliferate all on their own. Once they take on specific forms, we can intervene. Block a cooch grass rhizome, redesign Amsterdam, evict rats from their burrows, etc. But at the general level, the philosophical figure of the rhizome carries on about its own business. It is driven by forces beyond human control. It produces or turns into strange multiple objects with lots of potential different specific forms, multiplicities. These exist at the virtual level. At certain times and in certain states, multiplicities produce the more familiar rhizomes we see around us. But there are other possibilities too, which may never actually ever appear in physical form. Philosophy tries to work out the strange activities of these unobservable multiplicities. This is not as strange as it sounds at first, and earlier forms exist of this sort of argument. A leading structuralist, Claude Lévi-Strauss, says he was inspired by an understanding of geology first. We can explain the surface features of landscapes, hills and valleys, particular directions of slopes and so on, once we know about the geology of the area, the rocks that lie underneath. Levi Strauss went on to develop a structural model of language a bit like this, saying that all the rich varieties of myths in certain pre-industrial societies could be explained as combinations of underlying options to discuss important matters like the relation of humans to nature. Deleuze's colleague Foucault also proposed what he called an archaeological model to study discourses, where you inspect the remains of buildings or discourses that lie on the surface, and gradually establish an overall plan or CGI model of what the building might have looked like, which explains the remains that you see, and sketches in what has been destroyed. Now these earlier approaches are discussed critically by Deleuze on the way to establish his own underlying structures. Structure is the wrong word here for him, as we saw, and it also implies some fixed set of options. And Deleuze wants to argue instead for flux, flow and dynamic combinations of forces which themselves change and develop. This bit explains why he is sometimes called a post-structuralist, although he does far more than just criticise structuralism. All this is carefully, if sometimes bafflingly, argued in Deleuze's book Difference and Repetition, Deleuze 2004, but there is a much shorter summary in Deleuze and Parnay 1987, right at the end. To take one more example, the commentary by Delanda, 2002, is very useful. Again, we might not be using specifically Deleuzean arguments, but we can get a long way before we might have to correct them. Delanda says that modern physics thinks in terms of unobservable forces swirling around in a complex or chaotic way, combining with each other to produce vectors. There also exists various attractors that draw these forces together to form particular shapes or figures. Some, but only some, can be chaotic attractors, and this provides the popular name for this approach, chaos theory. As these forces stabilise, they cool down and condense into matter of the kind we can detect. The swirling hot forces of the cosmos just after the Big Bang 
eventually cooled enough to start combining protons, neutrons and electrons together to make atoms, then atoms into molecules of the elements, molecules into compounds, compounds into larger compounds under the force of gravity, and so on. Combinations often have different possible states which produce matter of different kinds. Gases, solids and liquids, for example, ice, liquid water and steam look and feel quite different to our senses as indeed do the gases hydrogen and oxygen, but they are all states of one system. So we've come quite a long way here. We've moved from couch grass to chaos, from the specific description of couch grass to general theories about chaos or complexity, from empirical examples to pure ones, pure theory, purified. Was it worth it? If you're a philosopher, yes, since it gives us a fresh take on all sorts of earlier philosophical approaches. What if you're not a philosopher? Well, at the very least, the approach helps us get critical because we can develop analysis much further than just by using a nice metaphor. Uh, you also need to guard your back if you use metaphors because it's wise to recognize that there's an awful lot of philosophy attached to that particular metaphor and that you're taking a risk if you grab the metaphor and bolt it onto some other philosophical approach like social constructivism or humanism at least without acknowledging the problems in what you're doing. Let's get a bit more practical. Perhaps this Deleuzean approach shows us that the specific patterns and links and connections that exist here and now are not the only possible ones and they should not be making claim to be the only possible ones, although they often do. This is an important issue if we start to look at the patterns established in modern organisations. Far from being eternal or natural, we can come to see them as stabilised, limited or blocked rhizomes. This gives us a space for politics for social change that points to other possibilities which emerge equally plausibly from the same underlying multiplicity, even possibilities that have not been realised yet. This will offer us a pretty radical politics, not just operating with choices provided by existing systems, but realising entirely new possibilities. But we only get there we only get a general account of possibilities from theory. We need to break out of existing constraints in politics and practice and trace them back to their underlying maps or virtual rhizomes. We also have to remember that human activity can operate only against a background of what is already being made into reality by non-human forces and this clearly also limits the space for politics and social change. Not everything or anything is possible. I'm afraid this alternation between political optimism and pessimism is something that you can find throughout A Thousand Plateaus. It's also a major issue with the more general works for me. Finally, I'm aware that a couple of things haven't really been discussed yet. We're told that a rhizome grows in the middle without beginning or end. Well, that's fairly simple to understand because it's arguing that we should not worry about trying to trace everything back to a single origin, a capital O-1, like the medieval philosophers did when they tried to explain everything as emanating from the will or purposes of God. Nor should we try to work with foundational concepts that claim to always explain everything. The mode of production for Marxists, the Oedipus complex for Freudians, or particular essential qualities of creativity and freedom that human individuals exhibit 
if you're a humanist. It's also clear, I think, that there is no ultimate end to pursue either. There's no glorious future of freedom and self-understanding. There's no state of final equilibrium in the universe. There's no peak of biological evolution. Let's get back to the issue of n dimensions. Well, we've already suggested that virtual rhizomes don't just occupy the usual three dimensions, but any number of them. The bit about operating with n minus one dimensions is a puzzle. I think myself that Delanda explains it best by tracing it back to some debates about abstract geometry that Deleuze was interested in. For now, we can read it as advice not to work with specific and unique objects, but to subtract them or abstract from them and think of the forces behind them, so to speak. We should also obviously take out any original capital O1, as we've argued above. There's one last mysterious term in the definitions of the rhizome that we've cited. We're told that a rhizome moves on a plane of consistency. Now again, a full explanation of this term can't be dealt with here. For now, a plane or plan, apparently the same word in French is translated as both of those terms, is a way that Deleuze has of thinking of possible connections between rhizomes or multiplicities in this particular case. Roughly, for now, we have to think about analysing each separate rhizome in a way which is consistent with what we know about the others. It's partly a matter of doing philosophical work, since we can never observe or measure multiplicities at the virtual level. But it's not just philosophical speculation. Instead, we are trying to discover by coherent philosophical argument carefully developed, the underlying virtual reality that explains all the specific cases. Proper philosophy works both with the virtual and the specific and tries to explore the connections between the two. As we'll see later on, this has got implications for philosophical concepts as well. Well, that's probably more than enough for one session, and as before, I'll leave you with some references to books I've mentioned and links to my notes on them if you want to explore them further.